Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on managing returns best practices. Um, I'm Brian O'Leary, Executive Director of the Book Industry Study Group. And I'm pleased to welcome today Michael Cairns, who's managing partner with Information Media Partners, a consulting firm that works with publishers and other entities in the book and information supply chain space. Um, Michael uh, and I came to uh, an agreement in early May to conduct a set of interviews that he's going to describe today uh, and look at opportunities for BISG to more actively participate in improving how returns are managed in the US and, and uh, potentially the Canadian marketplace, um, effectively developing rules of the road. Uh, Michael has uh, put together a, a really good presentation that describes not only his work, but some recommendations uh, and potential opportunities to improve. Uh, we were lucky to work with them, and I, I hope uh, as a result of today's presentation that you're interested as well and able to uh, think about joining that effort going forward. Uh, Michael, welcome, and thank you for both the work and for the uh, making the time today. Great. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you for letting me do this project. It was a lot of interesting work, a lot of uh, uh, very good interviews and meetings with um, with people who, who also participated in, in this. And I, uh, I thank them for that participation as well and being so open with, with the interviews that we undertake, undertook. Um, so what we wanted to do today is um, share um, a number of things that we found during the course of the interviews that we did um, give you the feedback that I heard when I spoke to, to the people that we met with, um, reflect on some observations that I had uh, that was shared with, uh, shared with me during the course of those interviews and, and talk a little bit about those. Um, I want to explain or, or describe a little bit about how the UK has approached this issue uh, and how they identify what the issues were within their marketplace and executed a plan to to effectively manage down the uh, returns in that marketplace. And then, um, of course, we want to suggest ways that we might be able to uh, use this as a baseline uh, to take uh, this initiative forward and determine whether or not there's opportunities to, to move ahead with uh, this initiative. So with that, let me um, get into uh, the presentation itself. So just to describe what we did, um, uh, Brian and I worked with um, a number of, uh, well, we identified a number of people uh, that we wanted to interview across the industry. It was approximately 15 interviews, it was probably a little bit more people because there was multiple people in the interviews. Um, so it wasn't a huge uh, undertaking. I think uh, if I remember rightly, one of the last uh, uh, projects I did for BISG when I looked at ISBN usage, uh, a number of years ago, I think I did 75 interviews. So this was uh, comparatively smaller than that. But I think what we did want to make sure is that we spoke to a cross section of the industry. So we spoke to publishers, um, retailers, et cetera, across the industry to get um, a broad perspective on what was happening in the marketplace. So so that was important. Additionally, we, we spoke uh, to BIC and um, Karina Luke in the, in the UK, who's Brian's counterpart, runs their industry um, group uh, that has a similar remit to BISG. And she was very helpful giving us um, a kind of state of the industry perspective on, on where the initiative is in the UK and, and um, some of the experience that she had when they worked through that initiative. So that was also very helpful. Um, and uh, obviously, we had status quo during the course of the meeting, uh, during the course of the uh, project, so that we could kind of bat back, bat, bat ideas back and forth between Brian, myself, and Jonathan uh, on what I was hearing, what I was um, experiencing, and some of the things that we, we kind of wanted to touch on for this presentation. Um, I left this quote on here because um, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, came from one of the uh, people that I spoke to that uh, if identifying just one very, very simple thing that might help. And I'll talk a little bit about this in, in more detail later in the, in the presentation. But um, things do get mixed up in the supply chain. And um, sometimes the returns get mixed up with actual inventory. And one of the ideas was to just plaster this label on a box to make sure that people know exactly what they're looking at when returns come back. So um, 
pretty simple idea. Maybe it has some merit. Um, so to turn to some of the high level findings uh, during this uh, initiative, I think one of the things that um, is interesting is that there are is, there's naturally a number of um, companies and, and groups that are looking to make improvement here. Um, and they're doing it kind of in a, in a very localized manner, although the initiatives, because uh, the, the companies themselves are quite large, relatively speaking, um, but they are fairly localized. But there is this notion that what they have done is kind of almost a competitive um, uh, benefit. So there's a question here uh, about whether or not um, uh, some of those companies can put aside some of that work that they have done to the betterment of the industry and perhaps um, BISG can help mediate some of those competitive issues that have arisen here. I think everybody does buy into this. That, without question, everybody that I spoke to buys into the idea that more can be done to improve how returns are handled in the industry. There's no question about that. Um, but whether or not some of the investments folks that have already made into this uh, could be shared or, or somehow set to the side is something that we will probably have to deal with. Um, but I think BISG could perhaps mediate some of that as we move forward through this initiative, if indeed we decide to take it on. Um, without question, um, there's uh, this notion that some simple measures or rules, uh, irrespective of whether or not we take this initiative and formalize it and take it forward, but establishing some very simple rules would benefit everybody. Um, and uh, somebody you know, uh, quoted uh, was saying that um, it's almost the wild, wild west out there that anything goes and all kinds of uh, uh, processes are being put in place with no, um, with no uh, 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 equal uh, preparation or, or um, compatibility across or between companies. So, so simple rules could uh, make things quite work quite a lot better. Um, as I said, I think there is the objective is shared that lower levels of return across the supply chain is a is a target for everybody. Um, I think um, there's also the notion, though, that um, if you have zero returns, then you're somehow missing out on sales. So there's there's an there's the idea that right now returns are not optimized by any stretch, um, but bringing them all the way down to zero is probably not an objective because um, some returns are um, uh, a cost of doing business and, and some, some businesses are, or some products are actually, um, the returns percentage is embedded in, in how they forecast and, and what, um, how that they, they think about the market. So that's not an objective to, to bring returns down to zero. Um, some of the larger players, they, they definitely matter. And, and I'll talk about this in, later on in the presentation. We need participation across the board, broad spectrum of the industry. I think some of the larger companies, whether they be, uh, I've chosen Amazon and Ingram, but there are others, obvious ones here that could also participate and, and help the industry to, to the betterment of all, all. And I think it's important uh, that um, we recognize that uh, if everybody participates, I think, as they say, all, boat, all boats will rise. Um, and then lastly, uh, and again, we'll talk a little bit about this later on, that there's this increased awareness of, of being more responsible from um, an ecological standpoint. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second as well. So just to turn to uh, the UK for a second, and let me just describe um, what they did in, in addressing this issue. And the, and the initiative actually goes back a, lo a fairly long time. Um, I believe um, that the KPM study that was commissioned by BIC was somewhere in the 1999-2000 timeframe. And um, at that time, uh, KPMG, which is a large international consulting organization, um, examined the industry and came up with a figure of about 100 million pounds worth of inefficient inefficiencies in the supply chain, specifically around the returns process. So clear indication that there's a material impact um, or material opportunity to, to reduce cost here. Um, and so from that genesis, the industry then undertook a process of um, determining how would they approach this 
how would they pull together um, a group that would address this? And um, the initiative kind of kind of took out, took off after that. It did take a fairly long time to um, become part of the marketplace, but um, I think the the real uh, identifying or, or the the real issue that that got everybody's attention was the fact that yes there's there's a sizable amount of money here that is wasted um so the uk then went ahead and um took that information um and it has since then been widely ado adopted in the uk both uh, the uk market off, off, um, works differently than the us but nevertheless, um, these are some of the larger companies that are participating in this with, together with the retailers as well. Um, and so you can see them there. So um, the, the, the initiative kind of started to focus around a couple of, of main themes. The first was to identify, as I've indicated earlier, some of the rules of the road and uh, technology enablers that would be put in place to to help with some of that. So the industry adopted some agreed working practices. Um, there was a long period of discussion and negotiation between the parties as to what those rules would be. Uh, and then there was the recognition that technology would have to be enabled or, or um, software would have to be coded and written to accommodate some of these changes. And that was both in the companies themselves, as well as the intermediary, which is primary in this, which is the uh, batch process. And if you're familiar with batch, it's a clearinghouse, if for want of a better term, for payments between retailers and publishers in the UK. And that, that, that organization plays a key part in this. So um, this consultant, consult, consultation process that uh, took place over a number of years um, it defined what the roles would be for, for the various parties, identified and documented the procedures that take place, uh, identified and, and created the change practices that would need to, to be enabled and, and created, and then created this uh, a standardized approach. And all of this went into a rule book, and it is called the, the returns rule book, that they've identified and agreed. Um, so the benefits of, of this process, and I, I won't read all of these bullets verbatim, but the, the bolded items here are the key things, I think, that we wanted, that the, the initiative in the UK has created a more efficient um, supply chain to reduce things like space uh, within um, warehouses for returns, much more accuracy, with the process in terms of how information is trans transmitted from entity to entity. Um, things, decisions have been uh, uh, accelerated in terms of the way decisions are made about returns, which has improved communication. Uh, planning is definitely improved in terms of how uh, you can plan inventory and understanding what's in the supply chain, what, inf what returns are coming back, where are they in the system, things like that. Um, and the declaration or the identification of rules and processes and standards has um, kind of level set everybody's understanding so that it, dis disputes between parties have been reduced. Things are much clearer, communication is much more uh, consistent. Um, so I think some of these things, you know, there's probably other benefits as well, but some of these things are pretty key and um, uh, once these things have been put in place and there's uh, been a record of, of having uh, executed to these rules, um, other opportunities have raised, raised their head uh, as the industry in the UK has uh, kind of evolved through this process. This doesn't mean to say that um, disputes don't continue. Um, in fact, there's a standing committee that looks at this still. It's not something that was identified and put in place and then everybody kind of just went their separate ways as long as they attended to the rule book everything was fine no that's not necessarily the case so things um, do still get adjudicated in the system um, so it's a it's a living living process uh, as you would exactly expect between uh, in supply chain between parties things things change um, things evolve 
So this is something that continues to be something that the BIC organization is, is managing. Um, in terms of some of the rules of the road, um, and I, I won't explain all of these as well, but you can see the, the kind of the parameters around which uh, the industry in the UK um, set these rules and, and what types of things they governed. Um, I put a note there just under the heading, just to make sure that people don't automatically assume that these would be things that we would want to implement in the US if we took this forward, because the US and the UK market works differently. So if um, once the, the US comes together and decides how to approach this, some of these rules would be different. But nevertheless, um, pre-authorization was a key aspect of this process, You know, having the stores um, get permission to return items. And in doing so, the standard, the standard communication around that, what data elements are they communicating back to the publisher that, that uh, in addition to that request itself. And some of that additional information is key to making sure that the, um, the transaction itself can work effective, uh, efficiently through the system. Um, things like returns windows were, were looked at and standardized. One of the findings, I'll mention this in, in a few minutes, that um, many publishers across the industry have different, different um, um, acceptance criteria for returns and uh, retailers sometimes are at a, you know, they're, they're bouncing from one to the other trying to figure out which, which publisher is requesting, uh, which, what the criteria for one publisher versus the other is. So the standardizing that has been, been an improvement in the UK as well. Um, cap limits, not to exceed sell, sales volumes, those types of things, credit calculation, um, uh, you know, things like the average last 12 month sales if that, as noted here. These were types of things that trying to standardize how, how the relationship between the publisher and the retailer or the, the wholesaler was working. Um, and uh, other things here that you, if you have any, any desire to look at this uh, in more detail, there's a link there that um, you, can, you can click on when, when you get access to this presentation afterwards to, to find additional information. And the, the rule book is quite extensive as you would think. So I've, I've only taken this kind of summary items that I think um, stand out to me. Um, one of the key things that I mentioned before was um, that uh, everybody has come together in the UK. Each of the primary uh, groups have come together to address this. I think one of the one of the lessons learned from the UK is the fact that um, the larger players and smaller players have all bought into this system uh, because they recognize that there's an improvement here. Um, and these are the kind of the compliance items. And this is the bookshelf, the bookseller side of things. I'll show you the, the distributors and the publishers in a second. Um, but you can see here the types of things that you buy into uh, as part of this process. Uh, and uh, you're obliged to um, uh, conduct yourself in the following way to make sure that everything works correctly. So you must request the authorization in advance. You must do it electronically. And there goes there to the, the technology improvement I mentioned earlier. It's key and critical to this. Um, the labels must be done in, a, in accordance with, with the uh, requirements, uh, barcodes, et cetera. Um, and then the messaging here uh, in terms of what identifies the, the return itself in the EDI documents is that coming back from the retailer to the publisher. Um, I do like the last second, the last bullet here to make sure that we're not filling up boxes that can't be lifted. So that's important. Um, so those are the retailer ones. And uh, I'll just show you the publisher ones. Uh, uh, publishers, the, the, the distributors in the UK pay, play a pretty important role, um, slightly different than here in the States. So they have to give permission to those distributors to undertake the transactions. Um, making sure your sales rep doesn't um, um, mess up the, the, the deal by giving um, unnecessarily um, adjudicating whether returns can be accepted or not. So keeping the rep reps out of this is important to make sure nothing happens kind of outside of the parameters of the of the returns process. Um, and then on the distributor side, 
Um, there's, again, the requirement for technology investment here to make sure that these things can be done electronically without anybody touching this transaction, um, implementing the rule book itself, et cetera, through uh, the EDI batch uh, process, the EDI documents as they pass from one to the other and the specifications around all of that. Um, so those are those are the those are the kind of high level requirements that uh, we've seen in the UK and how they have approached this. So let me just check. Uh, I was just looking at the chat there. Um, so um, to our findings here, um, and um, again to kind of summarize. In the UK, they identified that there was a problem. Uh, they identified a fairly substantial amount of money allocated to uh, inefficiencies in the supply chain. They established a kind of consultative process to bring the parties together to start hammering out how the groups would work together and the initial um, kind of blueprint for the, the uh, rule book, if you will, was done in that process. Um, they rolled out a pilot um, in the industry very early on. Then they went to a full rollout of this a uh, number of years ago. I'm not sure how many years it's been fully in, in place now, perhaps as, as many as 10 years, I think. Um, and then, as I said earlier, they've got uh, a standing group that adjudicates any issues as they come up. So this is a fairly now mature process in the UK that it did take a number of years to, to put in place. Um, so if we look at what I found when I uh, interviewed the 15 or so companies uh, in this process, um, there are, as I said, improvement initiatives underway um, from a number of different parties um, who want to improve uh, how they manage uh, returns. So by, by way of example, one large trade publisher has created kind of a, an education program focused around merchandising and making having the booksellers understand a little bit more um, in, in different ways how they could maximize their sales by putting more frequent orders in, uh, you know, the shelf inventory, managing that a little bit more effectively, and changing the um, kind of perceived practices that have gone on for many years, which is, you know, you you have a busy weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then Monday, you spend your time filling out an order sheet, you send that in, and it gets to the publisher on Thursday, and you get your order, you know, maybe 10 days later, seven days later, whatever it is. This publisher is communicated and educated a little bit more around maybe putting in smaller orders more times a week, and um, making sure that um, you maximize your shelf space and don't run out of inventory, but you're lowering the, the, um, the risk that you're gonna return. Um, there's a, an occasional um, practice of destroying in place, you know, but this is very, very occasional. It's not something that, that happens very much. One of the things that I, I failed to mention in the UK is that there's, there's more of a movement not to shift inventory from a retailer back to a, a wholesaler um, that has no value. And um, some of the um, processes have um, evolved so that um, some of that extra um, non-value added task of, of boxing up a return and sending it back is, is uh, taken out of the system and those books have destroyed in a different way. They're not sent back. Um, Readlink, which I think, as you know, is, a, is in the mass market um, segment have created within their processes a mechanism to identify which returns are not to be sent back to the publisher. And there's a, a barcode reader, uh, a, a RDF um, uh, process through their, their supply chain in the warehouse that kind of channels those returns that aren't going back to the publisher that got credit for them, but they're not going to be sent back because the publisher doesn't want them. They're going to be sent into a, a massive shredder and they're destroyed. Um, and they've spent a fair amount of money putting those systems in place there. Uh, BookNet Canada, as Brian kind of alluded to, uh, are looking at this industry, uh, this initiative as well as an industry, and they're putting together a committee there uh, in the very short term to identify how they might manage this process as well. 
So whether or not there's some collaboration that could happen there or not, we'll see. Um, LSE had an interesting idea uh, that um, they could use a, a QR code or a tag to identify um, returns as they do with uh, to uh, mitigate the issue of counterfeit textbooks. Um, and this tag would then be able to tie a specific sale to a return so that there'd be issue that, that it would alleviate the issue of understanding what bookstore had returned what book um, and uh, at what price. So it would tie the return to a particular invoice and make that process uh, work a little bit more efficiently. Um, and then Barnes and Noble under new management um, would very much like to Im implement some of the gains that Waterstones in the UK uh, achieved in managing returns. And they are also putting together some store-wide initiatives there to, to manage this process and be more effective. And then during the course of an interview with Wiley, they happened to mention that um, the return merchandise author authorization that they put in place for college stores um, really did improve their ability to manage um, the, the, the returns process there for, for college stores. So there's a few initiatives underway. Um, I think um, what we would like to see is a little bit more coordination around this and none of these ideas are bad, um, but perhaps if they're, um, uh, implemented across the industry, perhaps there would be greater improvement here for everybody. Uh, so in terms of rules of the road, um, what I found, uh, as you've, um, as you probably understood from my comments, there is no returns uh, permissions process in the States. It's not really common practice. Um, in, in places where there are returns, uh, requests. There's no standardization around um, what that document would look like, what that request looks like. So um, some might be quite complete, others would be missing key pieces of information. Um, one book, uh, one publisher uh, commented that um, they were surprised that um, uh, retailers sometimes completely miss some of the metadata in particular to, to titles and what their status is. And then um, books that might not be able to be returned or, or uh, are ordered, and then um, um, questions are raised by the retailer as to why they can't return that book later on. But in fact, the status was was there beforehand. Um, they also mentioned that um, aggregators sometimes, uh, well, they did blame aggregators, but sometimes metadata goes missing on the status. And um, they did a study with some of the aggregators, particularly Baker and Taylor, and saw an improvement in. Um, in information that's transmitted back to retailers to identify what the right status of those books were. So, so there's some issues around metadata as well here. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, rules from one vendor to the other are variable. So uh, it is a full-time job from a retailer perspective sometimes to understand what those rules are, uh, whether they relate to unit limits or time limits and things of that sort. And they vary because they vary from, from one, uh, one vendor to the next, they do have to spend some time understanding what those rules are. And standardization around that would be uh, improvements as well. Um, and then the actual returns that are made from retailers, um, uh, the documentation that's carried along with that return is sometimes good, but frequently poor and often non-existent. So that means that there's a, a, a huge amount of time manually recon reconciling uh, the returns to invoices, uh, the number of items in a box, the, the, the the, the units that are in the box, the titles that are in the box, the multiple boxes that might be in a shipment, those types of things uh, become quite a, an issue. And those costs are oftentimes reflected in the accounting department, um, at the order fulfillment groups that are trying to reconcile that. There's a, there's a fair amount of wasted time and effort in, in this process here. Um, one, um, uh, one major issue that was frequently heard on the returns credit was that um, uh, some retailers take this as an opportunity to manage their cash flow and they'll take uh, the credit against the current invoice. Um, and while that on its face isn't bad, if the process to return 
uh, isn't elongated. In other words, uh, a credit might be made today, but the, uh, the publisher might not see the book in their inventory or back in the warehouse for three months. And, um, you know, it's one of the things that the UK tried to do was, was address this issue, recognizing that probably taking that credit against the invoice was something that was, was not going to be given up, but concatenating or, or shortening the cycle time for getting that return back into the warehouse if it was going to be made was something that they could work on and they did spend some time on that. Um, on the level of returns when we talked about this during the course of the interviews, um, I think uh, historically um, trade retail has seen uh, returns rates as pretty high, um, you know, 40, 50% in some cases, but most folks that I spoke to in this discussion talked a, a little bit about the returns in the 20 to 25% range currently. Um, they have seen in the last 18 to two months, two years, 18 months to two years, uh, a trending down of this percentage. Um, but it's not 100% clear to me that we know why that is happening. Um, COVID had some impact on that. Um, perhaps better planning, perhaps uh, more recognition of managing cash flow. Um, it's not 100% clear what is driving that decrease. It's good, but we, we don't really understand why that is. Um, Amazon has a significantly lower returns percentage in trade. It's around 10%. Um, folks that I... That, uh, talked about this, recognized that they believe it's because Amazon has access to, to very, very good da data, uh, can forecast far better and, and create that demand planning curve uh, more effectively. Uh, and while 10% is, is a good number, uh, and also remember Amazon orders more frequently than most, um, that's still a lot, if you're doing 35 to 40% of your volume with Amazon and 10% of that comes back, that's, that's a lot of volume. Um, so while that look, that percentage is pretty good relative to the 25% in some, some other segments, it's still, um, it still represents a fair amount of um, work and effort. On the education side and education uh, college markets, um, this number is trending up. Um, those of you who have been in, in, the, in the industry for a long time, like me, would recall very low rates of returns in education, but that was before the market became fractured, um, online retailing became much poor, more part of the, the picture, uh, rental, other, other business models. And um, Nax has done some interesting research here. We, we did talk to Nax. Um, they did a, uh, a student study just very recently, and one of the things they found uh, was that the bookstore is still the place of the, the retail place of preference for the college student, which might surprise some folks. There's some practical practical reasons for that. Um, but what's what also is interesting is that when the college store receives the adoption information from the faculty member. Um, the publisher is actually the last place they will go for the inventory. They'll look everywhere else for, for inventory. And so when you're sitting at the publisher, having received the adoption information from yourself, sales rep, you know, there's 100 people and 100 students in the class. Um, by the time that retailer makes that order, um, the, the units might look quite different. Um, and then on top of that, um, you've got students who don't take the classes, who, who rent or or borrow or drop or you know any variety of other reasons and so this depend, demand planning here has been quite difficult and then lastly uh, there are some channel conflicts that occur in the market you'll see that because of the fact that some um, uh, vendors have different terms on what can be returned and and how much can be returned there are issues there are, and, and limits on some of those things, like the number of units you can return is capped. And publishers sometimes see returns from um, retailers of items that weren't, they didn't sell to them. 
Uh, in other words, the retailer bought a combination of titles from the publisher and from an intermediary uh, and chose to return more to the, um, in the publisher than they um, purchased. Not than they, they purchased, but uh, they make up for the fact that the, um, the intermediary had a cap on, on how much they would allow for the returns and they, they take the balance and they return it to the publisher. So that disproportionately makes the publisher's return rate look higher than it maybe otherwise would have been. Um, so those are some things on the returns. Um, and we talked a little bit about um, having large players um, participate in this. And as I said before, you know, one of the beauties of the UK market is that everybody has, has participated in this big or small. But people did recognize this when we talked to them. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the retailers said, you know, if the big guys don't play like Amazon, then, then what's the point? What's in it for us? Why should we exert effort in this initiative if others don't? Somebody else, though, did make the point that um, Amazon being a supremely good company at supply chain management, um, that they, as a publisher, recognize that uh, returns is not something that Amazon does very well. And so maybe there's um, opportunities there for uh, Amazon to, um, to actually make some improvement here together with the industry to make, make that process work a little bit better. Um, each of the Amazon DCs handle returns differently. Some of them are, are occasionally quite good at it. Others are actually appallingly bad at it. Um, and I think overall, I think because of the influence that some of the larger publishers, some of the large participants have in the market, that they could actually press for some changes here and and um, and take the lead uh, in some of these initiatives and really improve the the, the industry for the the better of everybody. Um, and of course, we'll see the benefits that we would see potentially from from this would be to reduce uh, the hard and soft costs, meaning the actual physical cost of of the books themselves. Um, and then some of those soft costs that I mentioned before, which occurs in the finance department, the accounting department, order fulfillment and things like that, where you see some, some um, inefficiencies. Um, improving allocation of capital and then also sustainability, which um, is increasingly becoming something that everybody is focused on. So um, while Everybody recognizes the fact that there is inherent in, in the industry taking books through the system and returning them um, does have costs to it, not just for the um, books themselves, uh, but for the trucking and freight, et cetera. Everybody I spoke to recognizes that um, this is inefficient. It's, it's, it's not good for the environment. And that's long been the case. There's nothing really new there. But I think um, some statistics that were identified just to kind of um, um, frame this in, in a way to identify, yes, these are real costs. Um, that when LST, LST was, was talking to me about their return center and they've consolidated returns in their, their organization into a, a unit in, in Wisconsin. So everything, every, all returns are kind of funneled through that, that um, operation there. But they process about 5 million units um, of returns and 30% of those are going to be destroyed, meaning um, the publisher knew that that book had no value, yet it went all the way back through the chain, reverse supply chain, uh, from back from the retailer all the way, you know, trucking, shipping, you name it, all the way back to that uh, return center only to be destroyed. Um, one publisher also uh, in a separate conversation, uh, I uh, noted that 35% of their returns are just trashed. Um, so, so there's real cost here. There's, I there's, there's recognition that a lot of the percentage of returns that are made have no value and therefore you know, they're incurring costs through the system that perhaps is, is pure waste. And perhaps that's uh, something that can be improved in the way that we manage this. Um, to the point about uh, sustainability. Uh, and I think the second bullet here is actually quite key in terms of a, a, a bellwether. In Canada, Indigo is the, the, it's the only retailer. 
um, and um, they have applied a sustainability index to other products that they can, they sell. Uh, and it's a matter of time before they get to books. Uh, it almost certainly will happen to books. And uh, so, you know, this is really just a note to say that this is this is becoming increasingly important. And one of the key retailers in the North American market is going to have going to be looking at this very, very closely. So I think at some point, these things are going to be um, even more important across the industry for us to take take a look at. Um, some publishers in through the returns process never bring returns back into inventory. So they recognize that um, when a publisher, when a retailer is, is not is going to return that book, that book's never going to go back into inventory, yet it travels back through that reverse supply chain back to the warehouse. Um, so I've talked a little bit about some of the facets of, of where these um, inefficiencies, where these uh, sustainability issues reside in the trucking, in the book material, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, you know, an, an estimate, 15% of finance and fulfillment time of publishers or, or some of the intermediaries is, is spent trying to um, um, uh, fix some of the issues that come up during the returns process. Um, I know from work I've done with a publisher just recently that they're that they have very very inefficient processes around the returns process of the, for books that they receive from their their retailers. So it's a it's a pretty endemic issue. And don't forget, I think um, that um, these are all in a way duplicative because of the retailer. They're of course boxing those things up, and they're actually when they do get the credit, they're actually tying it back to the invoices to make sure they got the right credit. So there is some duplication here, not just so it's not just bad; it's doubly bad. <clears throat> and then I'll just reflect on some other observations um, that I, I looked at, I heard during the course of the interviews. And we're about 15 minutes from time, 20 minutes from time. Just let me just check the chat here. Um, I'll address some of these questions in a second. How about that? I think that's fine. Um, one of the things that came uh up when we when i was talking to one of the intermediaries is that um and it's an observation of mine that books really aren't designed to be returned when you think about um how many steps and how many stops the book makes during its course when it's life and it goes from the publisher to the warehouse it sits on a box in a box that's fine if the box is sent back as a return unopened as a case unopened then there's not much damage that can happen with that book but typically the box is going to be opened, it's going to be shipped out, it could go to an intermediary, it could go to an intermediary DC, it could go to the retailer, it's going to sit, sit on, on, a, on a shelf or a table, um, it's going to be handled, etc. Uh, and then uh, it could be uh, collected as a return, put into a, a box, a carrier, whatever, sent back to the intermediary DC, back to the wholesaler, back to the publisher. By then, it's hard to imagine that that book is not is going to be fit for sale. Um, so uh, there are some parts of the industry that are just not um, not conducive to managing uh, a high quality return, and I think we need to recognize that. <clears throat> the publishers can hardly expect some of these books to come back on on um, uh, you know uh, unbroken, if you will. Um, I think. Uh, there are parts of the industry um, where uh, observations were made that the, the process of returns is, is getting worse and worse, that books are infrequently not being packaged um, well, um, that uh, the documentation that ca carries with those, those returns is increasingly uh, worse and worse. And so this whole process uh, needs addressing. It's just, uh, it appears to be deteriorating. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit on the forecasting and design and demand side of things that we don't really know, it doesn't appear to be that anybody really knows what the right level of returns are. Now for some books, um, it's going to be close to zero if you got a deep backlist title and you know, uh, you can see what that book's been selling like for the last three, four, five, ten years, whatever it is, there's probably a good idea what that return rate is going to be and what that demand curve will look like. But um, but for the most part, um, we don't 
we can't forecast effectively because some key information is oftentimes missing. Publishers who work with Amazon, who Amazon supplies them some, some data around um, demand, uh, they have indicated that that's very, very valuable to, to the publishers or the distributors. Um, in other cases, there's, there's still missing information, missing similar information from other providers in the marketplaces missing that actually could help as well. Um, and um, on the uh, last bullet here, um, it, it's an interesting aspect of the way um, returns are made, particularly when the credit is requested or made to a current invoice um, by a retailer, that that transaction occurs oftentimes with the finance team and the finance department, and not necessarily with the planning uh, and the fulfillment department. And so there can be a mismatch of information here where the finance team would recognize that return. But until the books appear in the warehouse, the ops team might not have any idea what, what is happening in the, in the chain, in the supply chain, and, um, and wouldn't necessarily know what inventory exists in, in the supply chain until that book appears back in the warehouse. And that could be, as I said before, a fairly large amount of time, two, three months is not untypical. And so that mismatch is causing, um, you know, pretty critical issues in terms of what what demand really looks like, and um, decisions around, you know, reprints or um, things of that nature could be made with with the, the limited information. Uh, so improving that would be critical and and important. Um, uh, poor practice. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that um, noted from, from the college side of things where if you've got a returns window, it's only 12 months long, but you've got a title that you've got sitting in inventory for a book for a specific class that you ordered last August, you know it's going to be adopted, that, that book is going to be adopted for an upcoming semester, but your window is about to shut on the return. So what tends to happen is that those books will be returned only for another PO to be raised for the upcoming semester. So you've got come books sent back only to be sent, sent, returned back to the retailer, um, only because that window is, is a static period of time. Um, I think the UK market has looked at this issue and had some accommodation for that particular issue. Um, We've also got situations where you've got demand, which is um, low in one area. So you might have excess inventory in one region, but you've got um, a run on the books in another area. Uh, again, rather than be able to shift those books from that low area to region to the high, high um, uh, uh, demand area, the retailer will basically return the books and order a place a separate order for the, the region that, that requires the books. So you've got books, again, inefficiencies in the marketplace executed there. Um, on the EDI front, there's um, uh, document types that um, do exist. There may be more than what I've identified here um, uh, that would help this process. And I think we probably uh, would also want to look at this area as an opportunity. Maybe this is a um, a quick opportunity, quick win opportunity to look at this. Um, but there are kludges in, in effect. In other words, um, the document types aren't, aren't satisfactory and, and people are screen scraping um, information from, from uh, documents that are coming in in order to create what is in effect a, a returns authorization. Um, I mentioned, um, you know, folks being involved in this issue and doing things on their own. I think one of the things uh, as an industry is that nobody really owns this issue. I think one of the benefits that BIC was able to um, uh, place themselves uh, and, and, and serve the industry uh, as, a, as a kind of adjudicator, almost the United Nations in, in some respects to manage this issue, but kind of take ownership. Um, and I think that that would be something that BISG could do to uh, to kind of pull together the, the respective parties uh, and and uh, address this this situation. Um, technology, I think, is is an important factor, but um, not all, particularly on the retailer side. The technology is can be a limiter, so we have to make sure that whatever we put in place 
can actually be, um, won't incur substantial cost, um, but can still yet achieve some of the benefits that we're talking about. Um, and then on, in terms of um, the BISG's role going forward, I don't know if Brian, you want to step in and, and maybe offer some perspective on this, um, but yeah. here's some of the things I've already spoken about. Thanks. Yeah, I, I don't want to repeat that, um, but I, I think that one of the questions we'd asked Michael was uh, to what extent is there a problem? And I think you've kind of outlined some of the both the issues and the opportunities. And then is there something that we could do as an organization to help the industry? Um, and I think that uh, there are a number of things. One is particular is to create standard processes and rules. Uh, a second might be better measurement. Um, and we'd have to have the systems put in place to be able to collect that data. And then ultimately over time, you know, uh, uh, an articulation of the cost of returns. Um, uh, some of the questions that we'll get to in a second, you know, are trying to get at the second phase of this. The first part, uh, the work that Michael's done in May and June and reported on today is really to answer the question, is there a problem that we that need solving and can BISG play a part? So I think the answer on both is yes and yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, one approach, one suggestion, um, it, it's not different, that much different than the way that the UK approached this. Um, some of this is fairly common sense, um, but to really kind of build on what we have done in this study uh, in terms of gathering information that we've had, um, but you know, being a little bit more clear on, on what we want to agree in terms of the objectives, uh, how do we want to approach it, um, how much collaboration can we expect, um, and um, what would a prototype process look like if we were to kind of roll this out. Um, additional information is probably uh, warranted here. As I said, I only spoke to 15 people, um, expanding that and certainly delving a little bit more deeper into some of the limiting factors like technology, et cetera, would be important. And um, maybe pulling together key, key players once we've got a baseline understanding about what's going on and, and how the separately folks might think we would approach this, then we bring together a group in a kind of a seminar format um, and, and hash things out. Uh, over the course of the day. My, my vote, Brian, is, is for, for us to do that in Hawaii. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah. And uh, so that, that's some of the thoughts that we had. Um, and let me just skip to the last one, last page, and then we could kind of open it up for questions. We've got about seven minutes, seven or eight minutes to go. Um, but these, what, these were the things we set out um, at the start of this presentation to talk about. Uh, I mentioned that there's improvements being made in the industry um, there is pretty much a wide agreement on uh, just simple rules of the road would, would be beneficial um, and looking at what the overall returns were across the industry identifying the fact that large players can have an influence here and they have an opportunity and we think that would encourage them to, to, part to participate and then lastly um, this ecological issue and sustainability which i think is increasingly going to be something we're all going to have to deal with so we have a, a handful of questions we'll probably have to move through them with more speed uh, than we'd like but um what, the first one actually from lorraine was just simply to ask for us to post the link to the iri rule book in the chat and while you were speaking i was able to do that so if you've been on the call and you want to take a look at that, take a look at the chat and you'll get access to that link. Um, Ted is asking, uh, and this is a question that kind of speaks to the, uh, um, your observation about an IT or a technology infrastructure. Without a player like Batch in the US, uh, for folks who are not familiar with Batch, the American Booksellers Association tried to implement it about, I think about three years ago and uh, Batch was not really that successful for a variety of reasons. Uh, in growing its presence in the US. He says, how do you see communications flowing between booksellers and suppliers? Uh, and is there a role for POS systems providers in that? Yeah, I think that the POS systems vendors would be the place I would start. Um, but again, that's its, uh, that's its whole subject area, right? So I think part of what we talked about on this previous slide, looking at the technology factors and limitations there, um, we would have to kind of expand the interview 
group to to folks that would have some specific knowledge about that. But I, I think in Canada, particularly, the point was made by BookNet Canada folks that they have a almost a single vendor in that space, so they they have an opportunity there to to work through POS, um, and maybe the same or something similar could work here. Thanks, uh, Barry's asking. Um... It says it seems most of the information presented is for publishers who have a warehouse and that's really by design i think we we, we tended to to look at people who could look who could provide information on the current state of returns <clears throat> in the marketplace but he's asking any suggestions for what distributed publishers can do to help lower returns and i think some of the best practice information that you provided um in terms of what what was working might be a good starting point yeah yeah i would agree yeah. So I, I one example is a, a publisher that was essentially asking for more frequent orders and um, mm -hmm. uh, and then fulfilling them with smaller quantities. Yes. Yeah. So um, the uh, just an observation that somebody in the education space that they're getting nearly a hundred percent returns from the two major uh, bookstores operating in that space. Um, and those those companies seem to be ignoring their return policies completely. Any suggestions? And I, I think you were getting at this before. Is you really have to have rules, or um, it is a bit of a wild west. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I haven't heard the hundred percent number. That's pretty scary. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, certainly, it's a, a you could negotiate it between the two partnerships, but if. Uh, if you're seeing that, then it, it's time for a higher level management meeting. Would that be yeah. fair? Yes, I would think so. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, Roland was asking, have we seen any correlation between POD titles and corresponding return percentages? And I think the answer there is that's not really what our intent was here. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I mean, you have some macro numbers, but yeah. we do need better data. Yeah. Yeah. POD, POD did not come up in any conversation I had, maybe it's just because I didn't ask the question, but oftentimes you go off in different directions, but um, it did not come up. Um, I thought my thought was that POD is typically non-returnable, but maybe I'm missing something there. Um, this is just, I have one other question, but St Stephen uh, from the, the UK, Stephen Long, uh, uh, mentions that he has familiarity with a lot of what the uh, BIC has done in that area mentioned that in the UK, the approach started with larger booksellers and distributors, distributors using Edifact and EDI. And it's kind of a grown into also greater use of Editex, which is a, um, a broader um, yeah. communication standard. I think Batch is also <clears throat> kind of built into that infrastructure in the UK. Yeah. Um, and the last question we had uh, from Edson is that he's just wondering about the feasibility of doing things like sending returns to homeless shelters or a place like First Book that gets books to low income children, families and schools. I mean, it, is that a, a mechanism that we could put in place? So I think I think actually the larger issue here is one of trust, I think. Um, and this is, I think, where where BISG perhaps can step in. That if there's um, a mechanism for the retailer to gain a credit for a return and then not return the physical book, um, the, the publishers are worried that uh, there's, there becomes a secondary market for that book, that things start to seep out. And certainly it's laudable to do what Edison suggested, but the larger kind of question is how do you make sure that everybody remains whole here and that things don't seep out and and as I just said create a secondary market or or otherwise are going to you know into returns bin or sold in the store for a dollar or whatever the thing is somehow we have to make sure that the publisher has trust in the system that the the books aren't somehow being um, sent to India or whatever it is so, so there's there's an aspect of this that needs to be taken into account on that particular issue. I think you have some contact information on your last slide. Is that correct? I do. Oh, um, well, this is just me. This is just you. Um, first, I, I wanted to just add. A, Jonathan had submitted an observation that uh, some publishers had previously been uh, selling POD as non-returnable, but as it's become both more widespread in its use and perhaps. Uh, 
not really distinguishable in the supply chain. They've kind of thrown up their hands. So it may not necessarily be an antidote to uh, uh, returns percentages. Got it. Got it. Um, the, I want to thank you for this. I mean, we have work to do, uh, not just uh, you and me, but uh, within the, the industry to, to kind of foster a conversation and see if we can find support. We realistically have to recognize that further work in this area would cost us some money. Um, the KPMG study that started everything <clears throat> 20, 20 plus years ago in the UK was a really expensive initiative. I think we can do something more cost effectively and build on their work, but it's not free. So we, we need to find if there's a find out if there's support for doing something that would, you know, as you said at the beginning, uh, be a rising tide that lifts all boats. Uh, I wanna thank you for the work you've done to date and for getting us started. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll have more to say about this uh, later in, in the next six months. Yep, yep, thanks Brian. Thanks everybody for attending. And if you've got any questions for me specifically, feel free to reach out. Um, and uh, it, it was a lot of fun, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye.